what we have here is the, a neutral lateral view of this girl's cervical spine. As you can see, the patient down the left-hand corner in a picture-in-picture -picture view, and we're looking inside her cervical spine with the DMX system. And we can see she has a quite severe reverse of the cervical curve, unlike the normal cervical lordosis that should be curving backwards. In the lateral flexion extension view, we ask the patient to bring their chin to their chest and look up towards the ceiling a total of three times to get maximum movement because we want them to move as much as possible. On the third flexion, I'm going to go ahead and pause it so that we can see any of the joint alterations. And as we count down, I'm going to go ahead here and select. We're going to count down the, the cervical vertebrae. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we can see the seven cervical vertebrae. And I'm going to come over here and select. I want to draw some lines because what we're seeing here is C4 has slid anterior on C5. So if I go ahead and draw a line on the back side of C4 and then on the back side of C5, we can see where there's a little stair step there. And then also, we're going to draw a line on George's, on the back side of the vertebral body, on C6. So what we're looking here, this is actually called an anterolisthesis of C4 on C5 and a little bit worse on C5 on C6. The only way the vertebrae can slide anterior is if we tore the posterior longitudinal ligament, which is supposed to line these vertebrae up perfectly straight. The next view we're going to be looking at is an oblique cervical flexion extension. That's right, an actual oblique flexion extension view. I know we're not taught this in school, but in the DMX world, it's one of the most important views because we can see the patient in the left-hand corner, and as she's standing at a 45-degree angle to the tube, she's bringing her chin to her chest. We can see right at the facet joints if they're gapping open. And again, I'd like to count down just real quickly so we, we know which levels, which levels we're at here. Okay, here we go. So we have got C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and actually we have T1. So immediately when your eyes come to the IVFs, they should all be pretty consistent in size. But we see one particular size, it gets even bigger, it gets huge, very large, and even larger. So we're looking at C5 on C6 right here. We see the gapping of the facet joints. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to draw some quick lines. So right here, we have C5 on C6, a large separation of C6 on C7, and a little bit less on C7, T1. Now, the only way these facet joints can gap open like this is we have to tear the capsular ligaments. And we're looking right now at the right side of her neck. So she tore the, the capsular ligament between C5, C6, C6, C7, C7, T1. And that is just the one side of her cervical spine. In a minute, we're going to look at the opposite side. Like all projections, we do this three times. You'll notice here in just a minute or a couple of seconds, we're going to turn the patient so she's facing the opposite way. And we'll be looking at her left facet joints. This is completely the opposite side. 
And before she really even brings her chin to her chest, your eyes should be able to go right to look at this big gapping of the facet joints. And I'm going to come back up here just real quick, and I'm going to count down again so everybody knows where we're at. Is we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we have T1. So we can right away, we can see again, five on six, look how big that IVF, and look, look at that gapping there of the facet joints. That's an indication that the capsular ligament has been torn between five and six. There is a huge gap between six and seven. Doesn't look quite that far apart between seven and T1, but as she brings her chin to her chest, you will see the gapping. So keep your eye on these three levels. When I push play, you're not going to be able to see the arrows and the numbers, but keep your eye. You'll see my cursor. Five, six, here we go, six, and seven, and T1. There it goes. Separate, separate, and separates. Here we have the final projection of a cervical DMX study. It's the A to P, open mouth, lateral bending. So in other words, we see the patient with her mouth open. She will be bringing her right ear, or try to, bring her right ear to her right shoulder, left ear to her left shoulder. And we can see C2 is right here, the pyramid, and C1 are the two triangular bones, as we know, is hooked together by a ring of bone. So I'm going to go ahead and push play. And we always have the patient do this three times. And you'll notice C1 is already starting to fall off C2, the lateral mass, on both sides. And each time she leans, the C1 goes further and further off the edge. I'm going to try to freeze this. And I'm going to go up here. I just want to draw a little, little arrow here. And you can see right, right there, hopefully everybody can see where C1 is fallen off the edge of C2. What that means is that the opposite alar and accessory ligaments have been injured or torn. Now we're going to have, that's with her right ear to right shoulder. Now we're going to have her bring her left ear to left shoulder. And again, we'll see right here, and I think I froze it just a couple of seconds too late, but C1 was even further off C2 on this left side. This is a left marker. So that would indicate the opposite alar and accessory ligament is injured. So on, in, with this particular patient, we see that she has both right and left alar and right and left accessory ligaments have been injured. The final part of our cervical DMX series is we have the patient open and close their mouth to check for possible TMJ injury. Watch her jaw as it slides to the right and to the left in an S pattern. Watch her jaw. It goes back and forth. And that's what they call a sigmoidal deviation. That tells us that she's injured the ligaments. When it does an S, she's injured the ligaments on the left and right side. And usually that's an indicator that the biconcave disc that rides on the condyle has gone anterior and is sticking forward, causing dysfunction in the jaw. Thank you very much, and hopefully you found this very interesting. Thanks again.